Welcome to this edition of Inside the Academy Studio. Today's conversation will be about Martin Scorsese's Hugo. Hugo is based on the novel The Invention of Hugo Capret by Brian Selznick and has been adapted to screen by John Logan and directed by Martin Scorsese. It tells a story of Hugo Capret, a young boy who has been orphaned uh, but now has come to live with his uncle who is obviously gone and operates the clocks in a train station while mo pursuing more of his interests um, on the other days, uh, particularly trying to finish an automata automation um, that his father found that is supposed to write. And in that journey, he meets a girl and they discover the inception and the beginning of film and the joys and sorrows that it brings. Let's talk about, I think right away, one of the first things we have to talk about is Martin Scorsese's foray into 3D. A very atypical foray, I would think. Scorsese is known for smaller films. Yes. He made his living with gritty drama, R-rated films, but now he's doing a family 3D film. What are your first impressions on that? When I first heard about this, I thought, okay, maybe Scors this is going to be like a break movie, quote-unquote, for Scorsese. Like, it's going to be a movie that's just going to appeal to... To your little little expectation of it. Yeah, well, I would say little expectation, but I say I don't think it, it would end up on Inside the Academy Studio. That's what I mean. Right. Because I thought it would just appeal to the audience, uh, whatever audience it finds, and, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't reach the, the critical acclaim level to the, to the Academy to the Academy races. It is definitely something Martin Scorsese is not known for. Uh, it's his yeah. first PG movie in 18 years. Yes. Um, so when the, it was in development, all people knew was that he was going to adapt this book in 3D with really no expectations, but I think Martin Scorsese obviously deserves our expectations. He's such an acclaimed director, and he does such a great job in, into 3D. Um, I read that James Cameron even said that is some of the best 3D he's ever seen, and that's yeah. that's high praise for somebody who's really latched on to the medium. Um, why does the 3D work in this film? I think it works because it doesn't overpower the rest of the movie. Like, I think the main criticism is that either the 3D is just a three dollar cash grab. Yeah, at least that's how it is here, wherever we live. Right. Um, or that it it's too gimmicky. Like when. This was a scene in an animated movie when you see a character just flailing their arms all over the place, like, right. and you see it that much. But I think in this movie, it's you're more you're seeing a living picture. I, I think yeah, I think it adds depth to the scenes and the sceneries, uh, but it doesn't basically make claim to, you know, break that wall and go right into the audience's yeah uh, realm. Right, it it basically adds depth to the scenario without taking away from a lot of the traditional movie-making sense. And I think just the way that even the, the use of 3D also, you could say, relates back to the plot because yeah. the movie is about the evolution of film, right? Over the evolution of film. In the, in and that, that's an day. interesting point to take our discussion. Yeah. Um, Martin Scorsese has done a lot of work with film preservation uh, and many have argued and stated that this is really his love letter to cinema and it was his childhood ambition to join cinema and a lot of these individuals, like George Mealy's, um, he took inspiration from. So is this really a passion project from uh, Martin Scorsese? I mean, yeah. I, I mean, because what, what I find interesting, like, it focuses on the early, early days of film. Like, it's interesting that even in movies, that's not, like, these films are not even talked about at all, really. So, right. like, late 1800s, early 1900 movies. Which are wouldn't even be considered movies because they're like yeah they vary in length from like eight minutes to like half an hour at most right 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 so Hugo gave an opportunity in a family movie yeah, and at that for to, a new generation to discover to the, discover these the the innovation of cinema yeah and you know go, and not even just a new generation there's a scene yeah. where George Mealy's actually sees the Lumiere brothers and they're their train robbery movie or the train entry, train, tra robbery. train sorry train <laughs> yeah. entering the station yeah. and then his obviously acclaimed and long lasting 
imprint on cinema being Voyage to the Moon. We see that. Um, it's really a chance for kids to see how film was, I don't know, not simple, but a lot of... Um, a lot of, like, less... How it was, like he says, how it was similar to being a magician. Like yeah. An illusionist. Yes. Which illusion. is, yeah. Yeah, I think George maybe establishing that is also something that's carried on to today's films. Yeah. I mean, look at even this movie and, a, like, even, like, a big blockbuster. It's all about creating an illusion. Yeah. Like, about engaging the audience. And then that, that's, what, that's what directors are, right? Yeah, there were scenes where you, you showed that his editing technique could basically create an illusion and an effect that now we depend on computers and that sort, right? Yeah, not that there's anything wrong with that. I fully support the development of <laughs> the computer digital, of digital cinema. Yes, because it, it we need technology to move forward in this world. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Let's move, let's move on. Um, this film takes place in 1931 in Paris, mm -hmm. and I think there's really two issues. We have Hugo, who has been exposed to the world of film and cinema, and then Isabel, who has really not been exposed but immerses herself in novels. Yeah. Um, is this maybe the divergent point of film and novels here, where this was at the time where maybe both had equal weight, or you think novels were losing its, its influence? Is this the beginning of the point where these two mediums became interconnected more so than ever? Um, yeah, because even at this stage, you started seeing, you started seeing novels becoming movies, and yeah. that's something that now we, now you see no, that not not just beyond the the adaptation. adaptation. I think just the merit that you can view film as a experience, not maybe not on par, but similar to a novel where oh. character development, yeah, story. By the, by nineteen thirty one, I think the cinema and film had reached a point where long form. Uh, movie could inspire and could develop characters similar to a novel and set yeah. scenes and plots and things like that okay yeah and then and then even by the time, even at the early stages create enough a fact that you no longer have to imagine read by reading a book yeah. if, if you if we're talking about fantasy yeah that you could actually watch it on film uh, absolutely even at that point yeah it was the movie mentions a lot film became a place to see your dreams in action. Yeah. Uh, moving on, I think something my co-host mentioned deserves to be highlighted. You felt that this was an atypical children's movie based on pacing. Yeah. Can you elaborate? Um, because based on my experience of children's movies, it's... <laughs> this movie, it didn't play down to children at, at all, really. I mean, yeah. there were child leads. Yep, yeah. Asa Butterfield. And, and there was no... Moretz. Yeah, there but and there was no objectionable content, but the but the movie took its time in developing its character, especially the first half yeah. when it moves when you when you see the slow development of Hugo Cabaret's character and its interactions with uh, Isabel, by, Isabel, Isabel yeah. yeah, and uh, then it, once these characters become established, then they move on with the, the exploration. I think. The message that Scorsese tries to bring is that cinema is a product of hope. Uh, we find Hugo with little hope, except fixing that automated automation um, that his father had. But you know, through that fix and then his discovery of Isabel's uh, papa being George Milley's, that there's a lot more hope um, than he ever had in the world. Talk about cinema providing hope. Um, yeah, because... Or being a vehicle for hope. Yeah, that's pretty much the, the final... Uh, that's pretty much what the movie ties together. You, you yeah. see that through, yeah, obviously, Hugo, and then you see that through George's character. Yeah. That film is what to keep... Film is what inspires them to do what they, do what they want to and, and fulfill their dreams. Like you said, yeah. cinema is a way to do your dreams. And, and talking about cinema, I just want to highlight a lot of... Uh, strong aspects in this film are the technical productions, including the art direction. Um, the movie takes place almost entirely in a train station, and a lot of detail and depth into that train station makes it basically a living character. Uh, we're almost nearing the end of this edition of Inside the Academy Studio, and like always, we like to end with questions. So I ask, what was your favorite moment in Hugo? I think I'll have to say my favorite moment is when uh, George, uh, 
George's. What's the name again? <laughs> I know I should know this, but are we talking is it Mulligan? No, it, the the he was a real person. George Mealies. George Mealies. <laughs> yes. 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 So much for wasting time there. Uh, yeah, when he goes through his entire uh, entire his entire history at the film studio as a film uh, director, the film studio yeah as a producer yeah and uh, that was very well shot and you really got a feel of why he felt so hopeless now because he had done it all and now now he was there <laughs> right uh, my favorite moment was um, basically in that vein where the entire group Hugo Isabel got together. Uh, with the professor, they meet and they view Voyage to the Moon, and then George Millies walks out and he's like, "I will always know how um, a camera sounds," and uh, just a great job of showing one of the most important pieces of work in cinematic history and really connecting the two generations of characters in this film. Least favorite moment, Hugo. I have to say, the least favorite moment is for the ending, which yeah. I think is. It's been a common theme in it, this this edition of Inside the Academy Studio. Okay. Uh, when uh, Isabel sits down and writes her book and just adds a bit of narration at the end, I thought that was a bit, that was unnecessary and it didn't really add anything to the idea of the movie. Yeah. So that's that would have to be my least favorite. Uh, my least favorite moment in the film um, would have to be the the subplot with Emily Mortimer and Sasha Baron Cohen. Um, there wasn't a lot of payoff to it. Uh, I, I know the intent was to um, humanize the inspector character, but I think there should have been more done. Um, even in a film about Hugo Capri, I think it was one of a weaker subplots in the film. Yo, don't play a hate because he's from World War One, yo. <laughs> okay, there. Okay. It's <laughs> an allergy reference, I yeah. believe. Um, <laughs> what do you mean you believe? You know it. <laughs> okay. okay. As always, we like to end with word association. Um, so when you think Hugo, what word do you think of? Clocks. I mean, <laughs> clocks. That pretty much it drives the entire movie, clocks. <laughs> and I think of the moon, uh, primarily on Voyage to the Moon by George Melies. So when we think of Hugo, we think of clocks and the moon. That is this edition of Inside the Academy Studio. Thank you.